is precisely that wonderful care and concern you have to hold the line, to stand up to the swaying movements of the age in order to maintain and uphold the ancient things. And if this is the last chance I have with you to be heard, then I am poised to leverage that very great strength in you momentarily. And when I say strength, I do really mean that. I won't be attacking that part of this whatsoever. So sit tight. You should be testing me for progressivism, and I'm proud of you for what it's worth. And for the third category here this evening, the ones who heard the promo and broke down into tears, internally realizing that you were not alone and that your deepest fears being a direct result of tonight's topic was not out of the ordinary, I say to you that you are the reason I am doing this tonight at all. My college students are grinning because I detest eschatology. For those of you who don't know, eschatology is the study of the end times or millenarianism and I, am per I personally find it agonizing. Only once have I agreed to teach it, and that was after 10 years of having been asked. And when I could not avoid it any longer and still look myself in the mirror as an apologist, I succumbed to the begging, and it took me near a year to get through it all with my students. That's how trip-hazard oriented eschatology is, and I'm not keen on dwelling on it for that very reason. I hate this subject. And I'm telling you this because I had every reason to skip talking about this topic tonight, except once again, in order for me to do that, I would have to ignore all of y'all's questions to me. And I also detest doing that too. So tonight is dedicated to the third category of person. You are loved and you are totally worth torturing myself for some 80 plus odd hours that it took me to pen this talk because at the end of it, you will find that I have subjected you to what your brain needs to heal from that trigger that I pressed in the promo to get you here. This is my love letter to you so that you can be done with that trigger once and for all, and perhaps to put an end to that trigger being present in the minds of your loved ones as well. And I say that because I suspect that the reason that near half the population of American evangelical Christians being triggered by something as simple as walking into an empty room means that we are dealing with something that is endemic to Christian culture in America. The history of Christian theology has not before resulted in the specific phenomena of mass anxiety regarding being left behind when discussing the end times, so why exactly is it occurring now? I'd like to suggest that it's because the theology that undergirds these fears and phobic responses is pathological, and that the cure for fears and phobic reactions, as is true for any iteration of psychological disease of this category, is exposure therapy. We desensitize you to the reality at hand by exposing it for what it is, an unhealthy preoccupation that was authored in your psyche by a traumatic event, a traumatic event that can be traced directly to dispensational content. And so exposure therapy it is for us this evening. We begin our odyssey into the weird and wild, with the reminder that I have lectured in several instances regarding the people of God getting led astray by men and women claiming to be prophets falsely and fanning the fires of their personal celebrity. And this talk is no exception. From the Montanists of the early days of the church to Joseph Smith and the Mormon problem, all the way to the new apostolic reformation of our era with their apostle prophets and purported command of demons in our midst. The history of the church is rife with this repeated error, and so it is yet again that you and I explore another one of these chapters, Zwickau, Saxony in particular, a city in the Holy Roman Empire in what is now Northern Germany. And the year in which we begin is 1522. Now for context, we're only five years into what would become known to church history as the Protestant Reformation. It was the dawn of the return to freedom for the people of God, a young Augustinian monk and college professor named Martin Luther is being hidden in Wartburg Castle in order to save his life, and he has successfully convinced Europe that they have been duped by the papacy, and the papacy is seeking to kill him for his successful persuading to such ends. He, with the death at his doorstep, is producing the first translation of the New Testament into German, and not just any German, but rather the poor man's iteration, an iteration that once released would reintroduce the Holy Roman Empire to Christ and not Roman Catholic ordinances as the sole mediator between God and man. Now Luther's works and success had been building for years prior to this point. He had garnered a significant following and many local clergy had been enraptured by his lectures and sermons. 
and that is, as is the case of every previous era in the church, when a very great course correction is about to be endured by the body of Christ, the phenomena of itinerant would-be prophets taking advantage of the erupting theological vacuum and peddling snake oil theology begins anew. And anew it did in the nearby town of Zwickau. Three men claiming to have been gifted special prophecy and combining bits and pieces of previously su successful political movements began teaching that the end times were imminent and the apocalypse was nigh. That we must separate ourselves from the rest of the world and prepare for Christ's arrival even to the point of geopolitical overhaul. That personal revelation from the Holy Spirit during this time was as authoritative if not more so than the scriptures themselves, and that the prophecies marked out in the Old and New Testaments must be read literally, with no room for ambiguity or symbolism. For them, they were the harbingers of the end, tasked specifically with the responsibility to rein in the eschaton. And for the folks in Zwickau, this caused enough of a hullabaloo that they expelled the men for trying to entice the populous city into rioting, and they were expelled to the town of Wittenberg. Luther's home base for teaching, where they continued to teach their personal revelations to the people there. So upset by the resulting burnings and murders of those unconvinced to join the prophet's movements or the leaders of Wittenberg, that they called Luther out of hiding to try to deal with it. Dressing him up as a feudal knight, Luther observed the carnage under the pseudonym Knight George, where for the comfort of his parish, risk death by stalking up to the pulpit his people expected him to be avoiding and proceeding to preach for eight days straight a sermon series now known as the Against the Fanatics Sermons, where he coined the term shwarmer in order to solidify in the minds of his listeners the types of teachers he wished them to avoid. A shwarmer is a play on the occurrence of swarming moths to a flame, becoming obsessive over source material that will ultimately be their undoing. Like flames, limelight appears to be equally enticing to those who cannot discern between their own imaginings and the voice of the Holy Spirit, ultimately authoring swarms of followers feeding off of the excitement and shock of whatever they say, next to continue feeding their prideful advance into theological folly. The culmination of which was Luther calling the prophets to the mat for their purported special revelation. After they, the prophets confronted him for his criticisms Luther requested they kindly perform a miracle in the presence of the body of Christ, as the previous prophets of the apostolic era were able to perform in order to demonstrate their authenticity. When they failed to do so, they cursed Luther, they left Wittenberg, and they took their apocalyptic visions and separatist sentiments with them out into the countryside and beyond. And make the rounds they did. Over the course of the rest of the 16th century, we would see case after case of the same theological obsession over the second coming of Christ and personal prophecy take hold. For example, the town of Munster, with their geopolitical apocalypse compound by which the folks trapped inside were subjected to more and more insanity as their so-called prophets descended into greater and greater iterations of their own imaginings. So insane did the one-year siege of the city get that when authorities outside finally broke into the city to stop what they feared was occurring, they found that the prophet who had claimed that the second coming would be on Easter Sunday of that year had also claimed that the city itself was the new Jerusalem, promised in the book of Revelation, and had then proceeded to declare himself the second David. He then decided to dial up his Davidic characteristics by making polygamous marriage to himself compulsory, but unlike King David, proceeded to behead any woman who turned him down. The genitals of the competing prophets had been nailed to the doors of the town center, and he had insisted that his particular swarm of followers dress him in the robes of royalty, to which they were happy to oblige, while the rest of the city starved to death, wondering with their final breaths, which horsemen from the book of Revelation precisely were they enduring? The reason, loved ones, that the three cages of St. Lambert's church in downtown Munster hang from the bell tower to this day is as a reminder to all who look up what will happen to you if you try to pull an apocalyptically fueled prophetic stunt like the men did who were originally hung in them for having done so. The municipality is not above placing shwarmers in those to rot. They are not interested in a repeat of that particular episode of their history regardless of how much zeal the person has for a heavy focus on the end of the world and the prophecies included in scripture to be able to identify it. 
but it doesn't end there. When you study this regularly occurring human phenomena of end times prophecies becoming obsessive to the point of culture-wide abuses, you will notice a corollary theme, an uptick in the focus of astrological signs ushering in the end of the age as well. This is the news from the free imperial city of Nuremberg in April of 1561, where the talk of the town was analyzing what in the heck they were seeing in the sky. According to reports, the best explanation was some sort of cosmic dance, question mark, ushering in the second coming of Christ and warning those in the Holy Roman Empire of the coming destruction of sinners. The description states that folks looked up into the sky in the early hours of the morning of April 14th to watch hundreds of flying spheres, crosses, cubes, and crescents begin warring with each other, moving erratically across the sky until some of those spheres fell to the ground in fireballs and smoke, causing damage to the surrounding countryside after having been assaulted by an extremely large black object shaped like a spear hovering overhead. The conclusion of the news that day reads the following. Whatever such signs mean, God only knows. Although we have seen shortly one after another many kinds of signs on the heavens, which are sent to us by the Almighty God to bring us to repentance, we still are unfortunately so ungrateful that we despise such high signs and miracles of God. Or we speak of them with ridicule and discard them to the wind in order that God may send us a frightening punishment on account of our ungratefulness. After all, the God-fearing will by no means discard these signs, but will take it to heart as a warning of their merciful Father in heaven, will mend their lives and faithfully beg God that he may avert his wrath, including the well-deserved punishment on us, so that we may temporarily hear and perpetually there live as his children. For it, may God grant us his help. Amen. Many series of celestial phenomena became the significant focus for astronomers and astrologers alike during this time period. From geographical Germany outward, it would seem the infatuation with combining astrological events with millenarian themes mirrored the cultural norms of the Holy Roman Empire's regular use of a combination of prophetic categories. The first being that we just covered Um, personal revelation or the claims of individuals claiming to possess prophecy or personal secret knowledge. This is when you see spiritual leaders pegging the Holy Spirit against the Bible and favoring their own mystical capabilities to hear directly from him without heed to what he's already said in the Old and New Testaments. And then the second, prognostication or divination, a form of practical prophesying where astrological signs are read as a map of the future or rather a predictive measure of what was to come in the coming days, remarking on things like the nature of which planets were passing through which astrological sign like Pisces or Taurus, for instance, or the traveling paths of comets across certain constellations. And sure enough, here too was the center of the most influential and successful prognosticator in the whole of the medieval period, John Carrion who, combining astrology with eschatology and end times themes, began successfully predicting natural disasters, kind of like a biblically themed almanac. Along with the year he believed the Antichrist would arrive in order to serve the royal courts in which he was employed around the empire, thus uniting politics, natural disaster prediction, astrology, divination, and end times prediction into a lovely little package where all of them are intertwined and presented as Christian. And that package, spread like wildfire, along with everything else. By the end of his long career and the beginning of the 17th century, this area of the world would bring, uh, begin tiring of all the commotion and obsessing over the biblical prophecies, describing the end times, which would result in the municipality of Saxony, where all of this was going down, passing laws that made it a capital crime to do so. No more prophesying either personally or through divination. If you are not reading directly from the Bible, we really don't want to hear it. Thank you very much. And this, of course, helps explain for all of my history nerds in the audience why the next phase after this point for European church history was an obsession with witch hunting and the Puritan area. So to summarize, I've just taken you on a short tour of one example of a regularly occurring human phenomena in the history of the body of Christ. Whenever a theological vacuum erupts, the dawning of a new norm or new era for the people of God, like when worship practices alter or seats of theological power begin shifting, we see as a result a sudden resurgence of that very package, divination, geopolitics, 
personal prophetic revelation, chaotic itinerant preaching, predicting the coming of the Antichrist, speculative attempts at the exact year the end times will begin, etc. Are you following? Fantastic. Fast forward to the theological vacuum of the early 1800s, where revival preaching is the norm now. Traveling celebrity preachers like Whitfield and Wesley have come and gone, and Europe is in shambles due to the Napoleonic Wars. This is the era of nonconformity, when Christians are left to their own devices to determine their own liturgies and local norms, as the denominational heritage of the 1500s is now too understaffed. Religion and political control are newly separated both here in America with our Constitution's separation of church and state, as well as on the European continent with the French Republic's laïcité. And no one is really certain what exactly that will mean in application as the years progress. And so out again, the eschatological obsession comes rearing its head, this time in the form of a controversial pastor and prognosticator in his own right, named John Nelson Darby, who over the course of his long career proceeded to preach and teach a framework so exclusive that those outside of their specific meeting house, called the Brethren, could not partake in fellowship or communion whatsoever as they were not true Christians. Once again, the well-meaning zeal of a young and fresh convert left to his own devices comes crashing to an apocalyptically fueled cage staging halt. Cage stage. That's a word we use in the field for brand new theology students. Every seminary professor worth their salt knows this time period. Every single one of us went through it. It's the perfect storm of humanness that is a mix of vigorous new blood with dreams of making an impact mixed with just enough theological knowledge to feel well-versed, when in reality it's pure unchecked ego dressed in monk's clothing. In medicine, it's the same thing. My parents, who are clinicians in their own right, used to say to me when, as I would practice my self-diagnosis of things, you know just enough to be dangerous, meaning that I could read a map, but that doesn't mean I had traveled one, and there are pitfalls everywhere. Most medical training isn't learning what not to do or most medical training is learning what not to do, not just studying textbooks. And this is true of theology as well. Cage stage brings with it an inescapable arrogance. It's that time when your mind is so captivated by a single theological issue that you find yourself bending every conversation toward it regardless of what the needs of the person in front of you are. And it's one of the reasons why I'm convinced the Apostle Paul added the single clause that he did to leadership qualifications in the church to Timothy. They ought not to be recent converts, he warns. Darby's story is warning to us all that ignoring that criteria brings about turmoil for a parish. Because John Nelson Darby's story begins remarkably well. Young, educated, atheist college student converts to Christianity and is handed an impoverished parish by the Archbishop of Canterbury within a year of his conversion. His resume read well the nephew of a famous British admiral serving under Lord Nelson during the war, an inheritor of Leeds Castle and its estates and holdings in Ireland. Westminster and Trinity College trained, as well as award recipient of a coveted classical language mastery award, exceedingly competent on paper. And for the Archbishop of Canterbury, perhaps he could just view that warning from Paul as more of a suggestion. Understaffing issues are grueling, after all. So off Darby goes into a parish to serve. And serve he does. His skills with rhetoric and charisma were legendary and his zeal all the more. He would regularly starve himself for getting entirely about his personal care while going from house to house, turning the theology of the area steadily from Roman Catholicism to staunch Anglicanism. Tract upon tract, he would write on his people's behalf, explaining theology and responding to the politics of the area during a time when the future of England and the continent felt rather bleak. Everything post-war always is, ashes as far as the eye can see. And it's here where the second, and I would argue the scariest stage of a young ministry leader's career occurs, when cage stage turns into shock at the reality of the job. That actually your shining intellect, rhetorical prowess, and resume is of no use when your people are just trying to feed their children and only pay attention to you really when they're in crisis. Crisis after crisis after crisis after crisis, after funeral, after funeral, after funeral. There are no coping with the crippling depression that descends upon you classes in seminary. 
And so what happens is that the overwhelming nature of the task that you've been called by God to do combines with your humanness and arrogance to produce the greatest threat to any parish, that your leaders begin to believe that they are the fulcrum point for the entire body of Christ. Instead of their preaching focus being on the actual individuals they have been tasked with the care of, their focus moves to preaching to the world. And you're now just along for the ride. They lose their sense of theological proportion. They begin viewing their circumstances as emblematic of everyone's. If their parish is in ashes, and they assume, then they assume that so everyone else's. And if we are working this hard in the ashes, then we've been gifted with an extra special ability. And perhaps this extra special ability is because we're the real deal, the true Christians. And that means it's our duty to protect true Christianity. And that means that the body of Christ needs us to correct them, disciple them into our brand. They have freedom, yes, but they aren't using their freedoms as Christianly as we are. And so we will begin heavily implying that if your Christian walk does not look like ours, that your Christian walk is suspect. And on and on and on, the reasoning goes creeping, crawling, perfectly logically toward legalism. And the dispositions of those caught in its grasp do as well. Hard, rough, calloused legalism. And it's here where Darby, with no check on his ego, fell to the enemy. He produced a cult, an actual legitimate cult called the Exclusive Brethren, I'm not using that term lightly. That's still going strong today. Where all of the mess of humanity, church history, rehashings, personal revelation being assumed as needing to be taught on a global level, accusations of divination, legalism, hardship for the parishioners, all of it. And where Darby proceeded to teach his 12 new revelations that he believed he had received by the power of the Holy Spirit after having been in a writing accident and being bedridden. They are as follows. Number one the nature and purpose of a dispensation. Dispensation is an old fashioned word for the time period, um, for a time period, any time period. And up until that point, that's all it had meant in theological history. But Darby believed that he had received revelation that this was incorrect and that dispensations were to be separated from the way that theological history had been previously structured. Number two, rigidly applied literalism as the hermeneutic for all prophecies having to do with the end times. You'll recall from my previous nights when I teach hermeneutics, I talk a lot about understanding genre in the Bible. The book of Revelation, for example, is actually prophetic poetry and is a different frame for analysis than narrative, for instance. Darby determined to ignore genre when applying hermeneutical principles to anything pertaining to his new revelation. Number three. He introduced a dichotomy between Israel and the church, that there are two separate plans of redemption and two separate fulfillments here. This is the first time, 1827, remember, that this idea was introduced. It is not ancient. It is brand spanking new. And you need to remember this for later. Number four, a restricted view of the church, that God instituted the time period or dispensation of the church age as a caveat since Israel had killed their Messiah, but that this was not the original plan. The best way of putting this is that the body of Christ is a parenthesis in a narrative that was never intended to involve us. Number five, that the Jewish concept of a geopolitical kingdom on earth was a necessary attribute to the reigning in of the eschaton, meaning that Christ really would reestablish a physical Israel and that it is necessary for him to do so. Number six, a hard distinction between law and grace that creates two paths to salvation and redemption. That the covenant of grace only applies to the Gentiles, and that means there is an inappropriateness to giving the gospel to the descendants of Abraham, as they have a separate plan for redemption through the law. Number seven, the compartmentalization of scripture that scripture is not one fluid story of interplay regarding God's one people, but rather a documentation of parameters that apply and then disappear depending upon which dispensation is being documented. Number eight, pre-tribulation rapture. The belief that before the times of evil come that all who are in Christ will be removed from the earth 
so that they will not be present to endure what the unbelievers will. Prior to this point in history, again, 1827, this concept did not exist. Number nine, that the purpose of the Great Tribulation is to test Israel against the Antichrist and Satan exclusively. As given that there will be no church present at that time, they will be alone in that endeavor. Number 10, that Christ's millennial reign will be a regathering of failed Israel in a geopolitical kingdom of exactly 1,000 years, absent anyone else. Since the church from this perspective is limited and only a parenthetical hiccup in the redemption plan of God, they will not be present for this. The temple will be rebuilt and the sacrifices will commence. You and I will perhaps be permitted to watch from an eternal city above earthly Jerusalem, maybe. Number 11, that the new Jerusalem will be a physical city and the capital of new creation. That once everything is said and done, the members of the church who have been waiting will be transferred to the city. The dimensions given in Revelation are literal, and that means the city will either be in the shape of a pyramid or a cube. You can extrapolate roughly how many inhabitants that sort of city will house. Number 12, and last point, that all of Earth's denominational systems are corrupted except for his that anyone outside of the separatist movement he was leading either did not have the truth or did not understand God's divine plan of the ages, and those are quotes, which is why non-denominational churches are to be favored over ones who are a part of historical denominational heritage. Now, in order to understand the impact of these changes, you need to understand what had been the understanding previously for the entire history of the church that is not an, an overstatement. No matter which iteration of which point in history to which you belong, the organization of God's divine plan was set. It didn't have a formal name because it just was, it was just about the time of the Reformation that the theology was formalized in writing. And it was called this plan, covenant theology, if you need to look it up. Meaning that God's dealing with mankind and progressively revealed is progressively revealed through a series of agreements and promises that he makes to them from Adam to Moses to David to Christ and everyone in between. God's people Israel were to be understood as both literal descendants of Abraham as well as spiritual descendants of Abraham. That genetic and national Israel was never literally exclusive as is evidenced by the litany of Gentiles that were grafted in as well as their presence in the genealogy of Christ himself that this entire system, both literal and figurative, is precisely why the bride of Christ is a mystery and why the beauty of Christ ending what he already promised was incomplete and temporary, the temple and sacrifice system, is so gloriously liberating. And that at the end of it all, when everyone is said and done, where you spend your eternity is contingent upon one thing and one thing alone, whether or not Jesus Christ is your atonement. Did he save you that day on Calvary when he ended the penalty for sin in his death on the cross? Because that's the question for all of us, whether we are Jewish or not. For in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, remember. This means that the conceptual framework that is Israel moves into its ultimate culmination after Jesus' resurrection, the church. They are the same. The church is Israel continued. A bride in bondage to sin becomes a bride liberated by her lover and looking forward to the wedding day. When it came to the study of eschatology prior to this point, there were already three distinct and robustly established systems derived from the hermeneutics we know and love here at RC. These were pre-millennialism, amillennialism, and post-millennialism. It's gonna get wordy for me, so hold on. Let's talk about them for a minute so that we can keep our bearings as we descend a bit into the weeds. The reason these are competing theories here is due to the fact that they're very, um, there's a very rare aspect to hermeneutics and that is that hierarchies you don't find. Sometimes we don't know which interpretive principle should outweigh another, especially when we're dealing with content that has been preserved by God in a purposely vague way, like a prophecy, for instance. There are things he knows we need, but do not need to have fully worked out yet. 
This is a huge mercy to us and is why the history of the church doesn't sweat this issue or try to turn it into a gospel or primary issue. If God had wanted us to have what was going to happen in a narrative format, he could have done that, but he didn't, and wisely so. Could you imagine what a sinful humanity would do to one another if we knew precisely when and where things would show up and happen and how quickly that knowledge would be leveraged by the enemies of God to plunge humanity into a hellish abyss? If not, then I encourage you to begin researching the Tool Society, comprised of significant high-ranking Nazis, and to whom Adolf Hitler makes regular reference, and you tell me whether or not Yahweh was dead right in keeping the precise details of the end to himself. Beginning with premillennialism, this is the theory that the best way to harmonize everything the Lord has preserved in his scriptures is by placing the future emphasis and presentation of it as the prevailing point of organization of the information. Meaning that the timeline for us looks like this, an indefinite amount of time where the world will slowly descend into greater and greater sin until we arrive at the worst iteration of it, which will be what is called the Great Tribulation, after all the events unfold in that phase, Christ's second coming will occur where he will reign for precisely a thousand years, after which will come the final judgment and then we enter the joy abundance of the new heavens and the new earth. If you flip the script and elect for an alternative hermeneutic hierarchy, you get the opposite approach or post-millennialism. This is the belief that the events of the great tribulation already occurred in the beginning centuries of Christianity. And that since that point, we are in a waiting period that will become less and less sinful as the world becomes more and more one to Christ, culminating in a millennium of peace and prosperity with Christ at the helm, followed by final judgment and the permanent affixing of the new heavens and the new earth. If, however, your penchant for reading the passages of scripture covering these things appear to have several layers to them, both literally and spiritually, and you refuse to guess at choosing um, a hermeneutical hierarchy, that would land you in the category of all millennialism, the position that teaches that the events of Revelation are to be understood as always occurring in every era of Christianity until Christ comes again and puts an end to it all. Is that still post-millennial? Will you switch it to all mill for me? That the millennial reign, perfect, thank you, that the millennial reign of Christ is not a literal thousand years, but rather a figurative indefinite period of time by which humans are given the opportunity to live out their days and make their decisions as to whether or not they wish to be a part of the new heavens and the new earth at all. And when Christ comes, that will be the end of this spiritual war between the church and the evils of the ages. The final judgment will occur and we will enjoy a peace with Christ in the new heavens and the new earth. Interwoven into all three of these positions are further nuances and categories. For example, in what iteration of all millennialism you get functionally premillennialism on steroids plus an overlay of spiritual warfare. In another iteration, you get a form of double post pre-trib, pre-millennialism. And if you're super serious about details, you change from post-millennialist to optimillennialist, which is to offset the pessimillennialism of historical pre-mill and amillennialism. Are we lost yet? Having fun? Let's keep going. If any of these positions, <laughs> next one for me, there you go. If any part of these positions or your analysis, this is where my brain is right now, thank you. If any part of these positions or your analysis involves the details outlined in Revelation as having first century parallels, like the mark of the beast correctly or correlating exactly to the Emperor Nero's numerology, then you are in partial preterism territory. We never go full preterist because that means that everything in Revelation has already occurred, including that Jesus has come back and the final judgment has occurred already, which would mean that what you are experiencing now is as good as it's going to get, and that Yahweh is waiting for some unknown reason to finish the job. Since that's horribly depressing and flirts with heresy, no one really goes there except for the Pantalists and Transmillennialists who affirm a form of universalism, but I digress. If instead you're, you view the details of Revelation as being looked for now, like the mark of the beast might be barcodes or credit cards or your social security number or the COVID vaccine, and you keep up with Klaus Schwab's crew in Switzerland and their World Economic Forum, you suspect maybe out of which the Antichrist comes, that puts you squarely in the category of futurist, meaning that we have not yet seen what the Lord was referencing would occur to Christians, and thusly guarding oneself against such things is critical. 
if you find yourself answering your spouse's questions as to why the house budget is going to prep her material with the answer to get ready for the apocalypse. You're also squarely in the category of futurist. If you believe that there have been many individuals who qualify as antichrist, or you go about wielding the term antichrist or mark of the beast at anything you don't particularly care for, that would be what is called historicist, meaning that history is rife with examples of beasts and antichrists, angelic wars, etc. And therefore, you are both not surprised by more fulfilled prophecy literally arising before your eyes, as well as recognizing that some of it already has or will come in the future. If you take historicism a step further and pronounce that the entire exercise is allegory for every spiritual antichrist or mark of the beast, then that would be what's called idealist, and therefore prepping materials are only really necessary for geopolitical economic collapse and not really very helpful in the actual end of the world type of way, since that'll just be Jesus coming back and those MREs will be useless anyway. And on and on and on it goes. Where it stops, only the Lord knows. But as you can see, for our context this evening, all of these positions are immediately impacted by the 12 points of interpretation that Darby threw into the mix in order for the hermeneutic hierarchy to bend toward his personal revelations. The point, loved ones, is that dispensationalism's introduction of the details and fears of being left behind, fear that one's level of personal holiness is what will determine whether or not you are left behind, the geopolitical West needing to bend itself into a spiritually and politically merged support position for Israel, viewing the Jewish people as not being a population that should be evangelized to, etc., all comes as a direct result of Darby and not anything ancient or historical within the history of the church. Dispensationalism is a completely separate category of analysis and a category out of which we do not have the ability to pick and choose. It's a package deal. Just like the package deals I've already presented to you that came out of the theological vacuums of previous eras. And it is not a good deal. It's not a wise deal. It's a deal that completely warps the dispositions of its teachers and students into cold, hard, merciless, fear-mongering academics who spend their days consumed with its content while the people of God who are placed in their lives for care and concern are fed with the ashes of legalism instead of the bread of life which results in peace. Which is why Charles Spurgeon, a fellow preacher and contemporary of Darby, in response to the goings-on of the exclusive brethren, had this to say about the whole experience of watching the genesis of the group and the consequent application of their dispensationalism to their congregants. They, the Darbyists, have no feeling where their principles are concerned. I know indeed of no sect or denomination so utterly devoid of kindness of heart. It is the most selfish religious system with which I am acquainted. It is entirely wrapped up in itself." End quote. Of this should be a warning to all of us, myself included, that all that happened to arrive at such a startling analysis by a fellow preacher of the teacher and students of dispensationalism was that they were subjected to the temptation common to all religious innovators, that of constantly advancing new revelations of spiritual truths to attract and maintain a following. Darby was a man whose character was marked in his life by deep piety and genuine zeal in the early days and throughout, and I want to be fair about this in spite of my criticisms here. There are many instances of Darby's virtue and strength being apparent. He's not a villain, but I must be extremely accurate about the outcome of his teachings because there are lives on the line listening to me give this talk, who I will address shortly. But by succumbing to this temptation, the temptation of not wanting to fall into obscurity became so warped that in spite of how sincerely he desired to interpret the scriptures accurately, he became caustic and even at times vicious in defending dispensationalism. Suffice it to say that he stamped in his movement with his, with his own personality, which is something that normally happens inside of a theological vacuum. Much of the spiritual atmosphere of dispensationalism belongs undoubtedly to his influence. From its divisive compartmentalization of the redemptive plan of God, its woodenness as to prophetic interpretation when convenient, and its separatist spirit can all be traced directly back to its founder. I would like to suggest that this atmosphere has not changed very much today, only a century and a half later, 
and it is this pattern which was set into motion then that is reflected in it today and what is ultimately responsible for why half of American evangelicals cite that their relationship with the church is one marked by steadily increasing anxiety. Now, if I were just speaking off the cuff, I would tell you that in summary, this entire dispensationalism thing is a bunch of cultish narcissistic hooey of a self-satisfied teacher who succumbed to the disease of every Bible teacher in the history of mankind who stopped protecting their own students from themselves. The point of a good teacher, after all, is that you become unnecessary in the lives of your students and that you die in obscurity where you belong. Not that you become a tyrannical dictator leveraging alarmism as truth-telling and presenting sternness as seriousness. And certainly not as someone presenting their personal hobby theology as the criteria by which Christians are judged. If I were speaking off the cuff, I would also remind us that if the Lord had desired carbon copies of certain saints, he would not have preserved in his word the reminder of the Apostle Paul to the Corinthian church that whenever someone says, I am with Paul, or I am with Apollos, are you not merely human? What is Apollos really? And what is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe, and each of us in the ministry the Lord gave us. I planted, Apollos watered, but God caused the growth. So neither the one who plants counts for anything, nor the one who waters but God who causes the growth. Your personal holiness level never entitles you to inflict yourself upon the masses no matter how well meant. Half of the problems I see on a near daily basis stem from ministry leaders failing to see themselves as the very things that the people of God need protection from and the people of God permitting them to continue because they fear being discourteous. If I were speaking off the cuff, I would conclude that rationalizing using theological terms is not the same as reasoning theologically. Those of us who consider our personal profundities worthy of teachings on a corporate body of level, body of Christ level, ought to be reminded that the caliber of response by the Lord is on a different magnitude than other sins when we err. To those who lead his children astray, he promises them an entirely different level of judgment. Be certain that your personal musings about the most important book in the history of mankind are not resulting in links on a chain attached to a millstone that will come for you in the end. You are free, yes, truly free to pursue whatever study of the end of the world that pleases you, but make certain to look and keep tabs on the fruit of where you're spending your time. Satan is the one who offers and promises global impact and celebrity to humans, not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit preserved that story for us to remember for all time. He preserved the fact that we are to follow Christ's example. And Christ rejected the offer for global impact, if you recall, out there in the wilderness. Because that comes not by the packaging and marketing of theological revelation, but because the Spirit of God is a roaring lion that is working and moving to accomplish his glorious ends, of which the end is Christ victorious. But I'm a professional apologist. And I don't make a habit of speaking off the cuff when I'm speaking on a corporate level to the body of Christ. So I'm not going to say those things. <laughs> and instead, we're going to look at one more element of this whole discussion before we open up for Q&A, which is the fact that dispensational theology readily produces PTSD. And that's not nothing. That's quite a problem for the teachers of this stuff to have to contend with. It's even more of a problem if you're trying to entice the generation of kiddos who grew up with this theology a theology responsible for their unresolved anxiety that was authored in them by their experiences with it and has driven them so far from a church door that it's no small wonder that things like progressive Christian circles are seeing an uptick in numbers. Their teachers wouldn't touch dispensationalism with a 12-foot pole, let alone eschatology. Um, and it feels home to them, right? Even though it's also poison, it's safe. We are roughly 150 years into dispensational theology being the norm in the Bible Belt. Many of you are sitting there right now shocked as you've never heard any of this before. Remember that was on purpose. Dispensational theology is no longer the product of a vacuum. It is a theological power of our era and it has been around long enough now that there are different iterations of it. From the John MacArthur School all the way to the John Hege one. Dispensationalism has been taught from one end of the country to the other, partially due to the ease through which televangelists and politicians can leverage it to sell books and garner votes, 
but also due to the fact that during the beginning of the last century, a man by the name of C.I. Schofield thought it would be a good idea to place Darby's notes at the bottom of his newly minted reference Bible. And that Bible was carried by and given to none other than Billy Graham. The point being is that dispensationalism is here to stay, and so is the PTSD that is regularly incurred by being exposed to it in all of its forms. Now, to those of you who are victims of this, I'm about to explain how this all works shortly, so hang on. I just need to do something very important first. There are many teachers of dispensationalism who have no idea of its origins, the repercussions historically, or the impact that is being made by its hearers. They genuinely were presented with it in a matter of fact sort of fashion by someone else and never thought about that content again in any critical way. Eschatology in general is a bear to teach, and which is why I avoid it frankly. Um, it's even worse to preach through, though. In my experience, for what it's worth, this part of the country simply doesn't have very many representatives of competing modes of thought speaking very loudly about it. And you're certainly not going to get any other side of that story from the news, given that the impact to the Israeli-Palestinian debate is significant. Be patient with your teachers and preachers, and do not scorn them if you are persuaded by my talk this evening. Talk to them, reason with them, ask them if they know the context of all of this, ask them what they think, let them explain, and then make your decisions from there. Please do not crucify some poor guy who was just trying to stand up for what he thought was true in historical Christianity. Make sure to make a distinction between preachers and teachers who are actually teaching dispensationalism formally versus preachers and teachers who are actually teaching premillennialism and don't know that that isn't the same thing as dispensationalism. That happens all the time. Do not crucify preachers and teachers who do not have a robust personal eschatology on this, or who have accidentally mixed and blended some aspects of dispensationalism with another form of eschatology, and who don't realize that dispensationalism is a package deal, since the hermeneutics have been altered in a way that the other eschatologies don't allow. Not every pastor and teacher went to seminary, and that's okay. Seminary or lack thereof is not what makes a good preacher or teacher of the Bible anyway. Not every parish has an apologist who can spend 80 plus hours putting together talks like this. Stay kind and work on your personal viewpoint so that you can persuade them in whatever direction strikes your fancy. Because once again, I will remind you that we are free in Christ, totally free. We absolutely are able to study the end times until our eyes bleed if we want to. Tonight's talk is not about our freedom on this subject. Tonight's talk is to get really real about the fruits of what certain theologies are producing since I am having to treat complex PTSD questions in this category on a daily basis. Now that that's clear, here is how dispensationally oriented complex PTSD is showing up here. When a brain encounters something new and traumatic, it does not matter what it is or its level of impact. Your brain looks for, to whatever knowledge structures it already possesses in order to explain the event. Normally, this first occurs when an individual experiences a real event of the sinful nature of man in the person of a ministry leader or someone who is supposed to be a Christian leader. The impact of that event hits your brain like any other trauma would, except this time. The framework your brain has in place is one where evil is not supposed to be encountered. Church is supposed to be the safest place in the world. There isn't a lot of room to explain evil to be occurring there. And so your brain's narrative through which it sees the world begins to fracture. The initial impact is highly stressful and your brain tries to avoid focusing on it for very long as it's too painful to think about. And perhaps you judge yourself that whatever you experienced was not worth dwelling on, so just move on. But what happens in your brain is that psychologically, it can't move on now because that's not how memories work. Your brain has encountered something negative and it does not know why exactly it happened and you won't sit and piece it together because it hurts to do that. And so your brain is left with having that unresolved hole in your worldview matrix gaped open. And this is important, so I really need you to pay attention. PTSD is functionally a memory disorder. It is not your brain failing. It's actually your brain functioning really well. It's just not in the way that you want it to. Memories are critical building blocks for your personality. 
you remember things from the past, not because you're recalling an objectively accurate record of things that happened to you, but rather because your brain uses it to experience, um, your brain uses its experience of the past to prepare you for the unknown, the future. That's what it's doing. That's why we have memories that conflict with people who are there. And your brain will not leave you alone if you have a memory that stands outside of your worldview matrix, or that is an unresolved memory that is keeping that preparedness from being fully realized. This is why some memories haunt you. you why you revisit embarrassing things you did in your head in the middle of the night. Your brain experienced something that it was not adequately prepared to handle in a way that it felt was competent and secure, and what was left was a hole in the way you were looking at the world. And holes mean a lack of knowledge. A lack of knowledge means you are unprepared for the world in some way. Being unprepared for the world in some way makes you vulnerable. Vulnerable things get killed easily, and your brain, which has a sympathetic nervous system response pattern for when it realizes that it might be about to get killed, pumps your body full of adrenaline to induce a panic response that will get you the heck out of there and to safety so that you can no longer be vulnerable. Triggers occur when something outside of your brain reminds your brain of that unresolved hole that then throws the sympathetic nervous system into gear. This is how PTSD works. Now in the case of our topic tonight, what happens when your brain's interpretive worldview matrix has a dispensationalism as the vehicle through which your brain has grown up explaining what is happening in the world? What happens to any brain whose introduction to understanding Christianity and our purpose here on Earth involves monitoring the paths of blood moons, spontaneous and unverifiable special revelation that could happen at any time, the potential for nuclear war to make way for the rebuilding of the temple, hyper-complicated eschatological charting, and the judgment of the people around you as to whether or not you're going to be left behind to face the Antichrist alone in an apocalyptically fueled nightmare. And of course, the cold indifference of legalism's edge. I'll tell you what happens. Hole after hole after hole after hole forms as you not only deal with the traumatic nature of the theological context, but also that there's no way to actually solve and close those holes, given that you don't know that there even is a context that is an alternative way of interpreting those scriptures. So there you sit, paralyzed cognitively, and the longer you sit, the more habitual the anxiety response becomes and the more rapidly you dampen the triggers until one day you walk into an empty room and you lose control of the boiling pot that is your brain and proceed to plummet into full-fledged panic attack. For the lucky ones, they receive help and care and a referral to a therapist who knows what they're doing. For the unlucky ones, they are assumed to have a demon and are subjected to a deliverance session which proceeds to fragment their worldview matrix into smaller and smaller pieces. This is the world that our parishes live in here. Not everyone, but so many of them, it's frankly alarming. And the worst part about it is that left unexplained, these individuals end up falling into a cycle of inescapable guilt and shame. Guilt because they see their brain's response as a symbol of their inadequacy in comparison to their peers in the dispensational framework around them. And shame because they see their struggle to assess the conflicting nature of the theology as evidence of their inadequacy before God. Because one of the control points for dispensationalism regularly employed in our area and beyond is to say or heavily imply that to question the revelations of men like Darby and Heggie and anybody else consumed by this material is akin to calling the Holy Spirit a liar. And calling the Holy Spirit a liar is blasphemy. And you recall what Jesus said about those guilty of blaspheming the Holy Spirit, don't you? It's the unforgivable sin. Have you committed the unforgivable sin? Loved ones, that line of reasoning, in spite of its popularity, is one of the most coercively controlling schematics I have ever encountered in my entire career. And I'm a cult specialist. And it's utter and complete drivel. Yet it captivates and controls so many people's consciences here. I have to assume someone is doing this on purpose. I don't know where this came from originally, but I do know that it's enough of a theme in dispensational circles that we're going to close tonight's talk by fixing it immediately with exposure therapy. 
Listen to me, please, all of you. The details of psychoanalytics and neurochemistry aside, you don't need to know anything about what I've just outlined to follow the Bible's explanation of exactly the same thing. The armor of God is what Christians are given to be able to battle evil. Yes? Yes, good. Okay, we know from the description of the armor of God that it's comprehensive and full coverage for the Christian, yes? Except for one detail. There's no back to it. This means that God's design for Christians engaging the enemy, be it evil, sin, negative emotions, what have you, is to face them. We are not designed to run away. Our armor is best suited for a frontal assault of whatever it is we're having to deal with. That's what exposure therapy is. We voluntarily face what we fear and we assess it in detail until it is so understandable to our brain that we're bored by it. I've taught you this before, remember this. So we face our fears together as a team and we take a deep breath and ask the question, is it possible that I have blasphemed the Holy Spirit and that the Lord will never forgive me for what I have done? <laughs> Open your Bibles to Matthew 12, please, beginning in verse one. When you are studying the scriptures, you take things in context, extrapolating outward until your explanation of a difficulty not only takes you into account of every section having to do with that content, but also that your explanation is framed in such a way that no two verses contradict. Therefore, we back up and look at the context of the conversation Jesus is having with the Pharisees that includes the section in question. For those of you watching online, I'm reading from my NET as usual. Chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on a Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pick heads of wheat and eat them. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is against the law to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Haven't you read that David, or what David did, when he and his companions were hungry, how he entered the house of God and ate the sacred bread, which was against the law? for him and his companions to eat, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law that the priests in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are not guilty? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what this means, I want mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Then Jesus left that place and entered their synagogue. A man was there who had a withered hand, and they asked Jesus, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath so that they could accuse him? He said to them, would not any one of you, if he had one sheep that fell into a pit on the Sabbath, take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and it was restored as healthy as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted against him as to how they could assassinate him. Now, when Jesus learned of this, he went away from there. Great crowds followed him, and he healed them all. But he sternly warned them not to make him known. This fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love, and whom I, am, I take great delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. He will not break a bruised reed or extinguish a smoldering wick until he brings justice to victory and in his name the Gentiles will hope. Then they brought to him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. Jesus healed him so that he could speak and see. All the crowds were amazed and said, could this one be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, he does, he does not cast out demons except by the power of Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. Now when Jesus realized what they were thinking, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is destroyed, and no town or house divided against itself will stand. So if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? For this reason, they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has already overtaken you. How else can someone enter a strong man's house and steal his property unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can thoroughly plunder the house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. For this reason, I tell you, people will be forgiven for every sin and blasphemy, 
but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good, or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. Offspring of vipers, how are you able to say anything good since you are evil? For the mouth speaks from what fills the heart. The good person brings good things out of his good treasury, and the evil person brings evil things out of his evil treasury. I tell you that on that day of judgment, people will give an account for every worthless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Then some of the experts in the law, along with some of those Pharisees, answered him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was in the belly of the huge fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. The people of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented when Jonah preached to them. And now something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And now something greater than Solomon is here. When an unclean spirit goes out of a person, it passes through waterless places, looking for rest but does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the home I left. When it returns, it finds the house empty, swept clean, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they go in and live there, so that the last state of the person is worse than the first. It will be that way for this generation as well. The context here, loved ones, is Jesus repeatedly addressing the greatest Jewish scholars the world has ever known, both inside their realm of practice, but also outside of it. Meaning that these men had to follow him around, attacking him verbally and physically in order to pull this off, over and over and over again. Willful pursuit of Christ, watching him do miracle after miracle after miracle, and sneering at him and cursing him for it privately, plotting his murder. These are men who had intimate knowledge of who and what Christ was and what he was doing for his people, and they conspired against him willfully. What this type of sin is, in, called in hamartiology, which is the study of sin, hamartia is sin in Greek, is hardened unrepentance. That's why Christ references it. It's knowledgeable, active rejection. It's spitting repeatedly in the face of God, knowing fully what you are doing. Zero ignorance, zero grief, zero apology. Full and complete rejection of Yahweh. The same rejection as the fallen angels, who the apostle James reminds us in his epistle, know the Christ and his Holy Spirit intimately and have for eons, and yet still chose and choose now to reject him. Hardened unrepentance. And you see the problem with this section of text is that for most of your brains, your worldview framework has no previous experience with someone like the Pharisees here. For you, even the most awful person you know had some sliver of redemption to them. The results of a culture that has spent 250 years weaving Christian-based principles into their culture. It's rare here in America, especially in the Bible Belt, to find an example of this category of sin. And praise God for it. But that means that the little hole that tore in your brain when you were initially faced with these verses and it was suggested to you that you might be guilty for attempting to question or test dispensational theology is only now finding out that the context of Christ's warning against blasphemy of the Holy Spirit was toward these men. It was not toward the people Christ was healing and forgiving of their sins. He addresses the Pharisees here, not his people. You see, the critical component of this sin is that it willfully cuts off the Holy Spirit from being able to access you. Something that you have to do over and over and over again, even unto the grave, in order to qualify for it. Past the grave, even. The Spirit is the one who authors repentance. Repentance is a requirement for forgiveness. To cut off the plea of the Holy Spirit is rejecting the vehicle through which you arrive at the foot of Christ's cross. 
blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is not some vague, amorphous rejection or poor behavior or using the Lord's name lightly. And it certainly isn't testing the claims of theologians. It's the Holy Spirit himself who commands us to test everything and everyone in his scriptures so that you can know for certain whether or not it's him, since he has also warned that the evil one will regularly try to impersonate him to lead you into despair. The Spirit is who authors concern over the state of your soul. The worry and concern and deep ache of terror that perhaps you have done something unforgivable is precisely the evidence that you have not done that. It's what the Pharisees didn't have. What you're feeling is repentance. Technically speaking, what you're feeling is conviction of sin, followed by your heart's cry for mercy. And hardened, unrepentant hearts do not feel conviction, and they do not cry out for mercy. This is why when you are first accused of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit as a control point over your behavior, your heart immediately protested, but does not Christ forgive all sins? Yes, he does. And your heart knew to protest because the Holy Spirit lives in you. Christ simply will not force anyone who actively chooses to reject him with every fiber of their being to spend eternity with him if they wish not to. He is not a coercive God. You are free to be apart from him if you wish it. And it is for this reason that those who choose the path remain unforgiven because forgiven people go to be with Christ. And this type of person is wanting to work against that even to the point of the Pharisee's ultimate goal the assassination of the only thing that could ever deliver them. And not because of some accident or question posed or specific sin of action. The irony of this entire exercise is that the person who initially suggested that you might be blaspheming the Holy Spirit in this way is embodying in the very suggestion the spirit of the Pharisees in this passage. Because I don't know about you, but suggesting that the very thing by which you are saved has some hidden esoteric caveat that you can accidentally become guilty of sounds an awful lot like something the evil one would say. And the result of said suggestion being the shackles of insecurity and fear and silence while suffering from it sounds exactly like the evil one's work to me as well. The key, loved ones, to those shackles is in your pocket, where the word of God waits for you with a swipe of an app, or the more old-fashioned turn of a page. Show the folks who are shackled where to find the key in their pockets too, especially the ones who are suggesting the things we have here tonight discussed. And with that, we open up for Q&A. There's a mic here and a mic here. Feel free to form lines. Thank you for the 80 hours of presentation and the passionate presentation. You are welcome, my friend. As we share the heart for those who have been wounded by this, um, but also just by PTSD in general. It is rampant in the younger generation right now. A more general end time theme is wars and rumors of wars and other things that can cause a stunted sense of hope for this world. How would you <clears throat> counsel us to support uh, the young people and to address a very fractious, scary world? How do we help guard them from PTSD? If you couldn't hear in the break, he was just saying, hey, how can I take care of the young people who have PTSD, functionally speaking? Um, call it what it is and make sure they know that they're not being weak. I hear that a lot. We can't talk about this because we're automatically assumed to just be making a big deal, mountains out of molehills and all that. It would be better for us to call a hole and a tear what it is, even if you consider it a small one, um, because it is a hole and a tear. That's why I showed you the brain scan. It really exists. So we need to stop comparing magnitudes of traumas and just call it what it is and fix it. Like if we could just maybe stop the quality judgments, that would be what I would recommend initially, at least, at least for that. And then, of course, as much exposure therapy as possible. Hey, there's another way to interpret this stuff, and it's called covenant theology. Or you can just, if, you're, if covenant theology makes you 
you know, prickle a little bit because that might be a little too reformed sounding, which happens, it's okay. That was just codified at that time. Just go to any time prior to the Reformation and you can have exactly the same thing. Go ahead, Forrest. Hello. Hello. So, um, as a lifelong non-believer, um, I have interacted with people through the rationals of East Tennessee especially, who have come from a Christian background and would describe themselves have been um, damaged by it or traumatized by it. I bet. Um, and I'm remembering, as I saw your fascinating presentation on dispensationalism, a program we had um, on Millerism. I was expecting you to actually mention Millerism, and it was after that program and discussion where one of our members talked about the Schofield, I think he called it the Schofield Bible, but he may have, Bible, yeah. Yeah. could he have called it the Darby Bible as well? Would they be synonymous? They are not. Darby had his own translation of the scriptures. All so right. he did. It's a totally different Bible. I didn't study for that part of this. That's test. okay. That's okay. This is excellent. The okay. fact that you knew to say Millerites is high, highly impressive. Yes. Well, and so is there a connection? And if so, why didn't, it wasn't not important enough to mention. Oh. Um, and um, so there's this hour long program. You can still find it on YouTube. Yeah. I don't remember its exact name. It was fascinating. Um, this is a program that the Rationalist Society put on or this is like a, a documentary on the Millerites? Oh, it was a documentary on Millerites yeah, great. that we watched. Perfect, um, yes, I know exactly what you're talking about, I bet. Do you know the title? I don't remember, it's, it's called The Millerites. It, PBS did it, right? Probably, yes. Yeah, it's as excellent. I said, it was a fascinating uh, program. We had discussion yeah. on it, and it gave me insight as to the origin of Christian denominations or sects uh, that are around us uh, to this day, um, as well as things like the, uh, well, and this would have been the 1800s, as well as things that happened in the early 20th century, and then even here in the 21st century. Yeah. And I wrote in my notes, Harold Camping. I think Harold yeah. Camping was oh, one well of them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I th I'm bringing all this up in hopes that you might expound a little more. I have many other questions, but I in insist on other people asking some more Thank before you. I volunteer. Yeah, no I problem. So the truth take is, more of your time. The truth is, you can ask my husband. He's sitting over there. Uh, the truth is, my office got so bad over the course of several months of preparing for this, along with a couple other things, that it looks like the room of requirement, and you can't even sit down in the apologetics office. That's how they're scattered, and. I was becoming neurotic over preparing for this because I was like, what do I talk about? I was just scattered everywhere, all these things. Millerites, Harold Camping, the whole nine yards. Anybody who does regular um, projections onto the, the uh, age of the earth and the end times, things like that, camping being one of them. Um, and it got so intense for me with all the other things, I was like, I am so bogged down, I don't even know what to do. And so I'd moved everything off of my bed, which is where I was sitting. And I focused on just the three things that I had that I wanted, that I knew I wanted to address. Then those are me taking my own advice, which is what do my people need, not what are my things that I want to rail against. Because I could preach all day long. So the three things were the three things that were coming up the most in this parish. And so I purged everything else, and I just focused on that. And when I timed my talk, it was over an hour. And I was like, well... Over an hour it is, but that means there's no room for anything else. So we can talk in depth about all the other dispensational iterations of this that are extremely damaging. Harold Camping being one of them, Millerites being another. Um, but there are just too many. So I cut it out. It's not that it's not important, it's just I got neurotic. That's the truth. I was expecting there to be a connection. Am I wrong? A connection? Um, between Millerites and the origin of dispensationalism. Yes. There's, there's a connection, but not in a way that is, I wanted the Genesis to be the thing that we focus on because I, I was guessing that if I focused on the Genesis that I would fulfill the, my criteria at the opening of the talk, which was I want to present things that other people hadn't heard. And I haven't seen any Darby documentaries yet. When talking to like students in like the deconstruction movement, do you see any specific hallmarks of the church hurt being from dispensationalism as in like if you're talking to someone like oh that word that trigger that kind of common theme that is the root of what they're dealing with here yes okay. vast majority um dispensationalism as a word no 
the concepts taught specifically in Darby's iteration of dispensationalism, yes. So like Tim LaHaye's Left Behind series, pure Darby. What are like the indications when you're talking to someone that that is the root of their deconstruction? Oh good, ask them why they hate Christianity. Okay. They'll let you know. And just mark, how many of them were as a result of Darby's theology in this area? After you. Uh, actually, this kind of builds on the question that was just asked. Um, as somebody who works in the helping field, I've actually come across a lot of people my age that it's very clear that that harm, that PTSD from uh, dispensationalism is there. But then because of that and because of the church trauma that they're facing, they have completely shut off to any sort of conversation about that. And in the helping field that I work, I tend to swerve sometimes in the clinical and sometimes in the more spiritual, and that's a little hard to balance that line. Um, is there anything other than directing somebody towards you know, certain scriptures or like educational pieces, um, maybe even like the video of tonight, um, at a base level that you found that might pique the interest of somebody who considers themselves to be non-Christian or against Christianity or organized religion um, that might maybe point them in that direction where it's like, hey, this is so, so, so important and I really would like you to look at this. Besides that beautiful speech that you just gave, and you can just say that out loud, <laughs> and I want to encourage you to be able to do that because clinicians have a lot more freedom than they realize. Um, I think that's marvelous. Um, I have found that affirming the rationality of walking away from the church for those reasons is extremely helpful. So something along the lines of, oh man, we're in the club together, and they normally go, what? Because I have people who are horribly affected by dispensational theology, um, like lifelong PTSD, um, and like genuine, 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 genuine. We're talking, when I say that, I mean that in a clinical sense. Um, and so just to say, oh, you and me too. And then for them to be like, I thought you were a, Christ a Christian. And then you go, yeah, I would also walk away for all of that nonsense, totally rational. I'm glad to see that your brain's intact. Well done. That normally is a good place to start. So uh, this, start, this starts out as a really exciting topic for a lot of new believers. And they really eat it up. And, it, and it's fun, yeah. So um, what's your advice for kind of helping to temper that? Yeah. Never let the guy who really wants to teach eschatology teach eschatology. <laughs> That's my first advice. <laughs> No, one of the things, what we could do, be, being young and zealous is wonderful, and we all go through it, and there's nothing wrong with it. That's why we're supposed to have people who are older than us and wiser than us help us dampen and be in some type of discipleship framework in that regard, and I mean that loosely. Help them, just be like, hey, just whoosh, take a break, set it down. Can you set it down? You can't set it down? We're going to talk about addiction now. Because you just told me you can't set it down. Like, you know what I mean? Just temper. It's not any different than you would with any young person. And it's glorious that they're pouring over the scriptures. Absolutely glorious. But obsession is something that comes for all of us. And it's okay for us to go, oh, is this, are we obsessive now? Is this an addiction? Let's call it what it is. I highly recommend that, that route. Teach them about cage stage. They normally are like, oh, I know that guy. I don't want to be that guy. And, like, and it's over. Hey, so I had a question. Is premillennialism expressly tied to dispensationalism? Because you were talking about like dispensationalism is a package deal. Is that part of the package deal or is it possible um, to have that separate? Totally separate. Okay. You can completely separate it. Many people do. They just grew up thinking that the idea that the world is going to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and arrive at the Great Tribulation and then is going to happen and then millennial reign of Christ and then final judgment that that is dispensationalism and it's not um, even with the topic of rapture for example the only thing that dispensationalism brought up was pre-tribulation rapture the idea that Christians wouldn't go through any of that um, he was the first person to present that post-tribulation rapture had been around for centuries so rapture in general is not a problem 
It's the fact of the pre-trib aspect, the fact that we are gonna walk into an empty room and it's because you're really not a Christian and everybody else has disappeared and now you're, you're in for it. You're in for a wild ride. Yes, back there. Is this thing on? Whoa, that's loud. Okay, that's okay. Uh, we've got a question from online. Uh, you said that blasphemy or the HS was something that you would have to, I didn't read this before I started it's talking. Okay. Hold on. Uh, blasphemy or uh, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit of the Holy Spirit thank you I was like what a blasphemy of the Holy Spirit was something that you would have to do over and over again under the grave even past the grave what does that mean so uh, that's an allusion to the unrepentant nature of that so the reason why Jesus talks about unrepentance that's a process it's not a one-time thing you're regularly unrepentant that's the point of using that word that's why Jesus does it um, when you're blas there's no such thing as oops i blasphemed the holy spirit two days ago or maybe i'm doing it now this is something that would have to be a regular theme unto the pharisees level that's why jesus is addressing it so that's why i brought that up so i said all the way to the grave meaning that if you repent right at the end that's okay um, and i said even after the grave to make sure that i was taking into account all of the parishes who affirm post death so post-mortem evangelism, which is that there's a time period after you have left that's an intermediate time period between you going to heaven or hell that you have time to repent. And that's based on all of the near-death experience documentation that says that that exists. So I was making sure I was encapsulating everybody as much as I could. Would you say that the theology that you just said for 200 years or more has let's say deviated, should it be avoided, studied, bundled up to be recognized and set aside in proper pursuit of Christian theology? Yeah, I don't think it's an excellent question. Thank you, honey. That's my husband. Good job. He's not a plant. Um, I don't know. I thought about this too, about whether or not, like I gave you my two cents, Anna's two cents, just so that you knew where I was coming from and the kind of bias that you were dealing with. Um, but I included up here, and this is why I brought this stuff, there are moves to do all of the above to what you just brought up. Um, number one, this is called discovering dispensationalism. This is the best argument against everything that I just presented to you. So if you really are like, oop, Anna's a heretic, this is the book you need. Good luck, it doesn't do a good job. Uh, next is, um, where is it up here? There's one up here, it's called progressive covenantalism, and there's also progressive dispensationalism, and it's the, it's the attempt by seminary students to find a middle path between the two. I'm not thrilled by that, because I'm a cult and a religion specialist, you recall. So as soon as I see the results being a full-fledged, genuine cult, still around today, absolutely terrifying, um, read about it. They're gonna, I think they're doing a documentary right now. Um, I just, I'm like, Ugh, put it away. That is pathological, it's moldy, let just chuck it. That's my personal preference. But um, we are free. We are free to study theology. And if you really like this stuff, progressive covenantalism is an excellent place to start, as well as the progressive dispensationalism, so that's coming from the other side, um, trying to get closer and closer and closer to each other. Because functionally speaking, at the end of the day, you can technically just have two modes for organizing church history. You can. It's just difficult. Hold the phone, Della, for just a second. We're going to go here. I hope that answers your question, Justin. Don't worry. We have an office. You can go through all my books. <laughs> go ahead. Um, I would just like to apologize in advance. Um, so I just had some questions. You and I talked. Uh, You're the comet guy. Yes. Yeah. So I, I, hi. Hi. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Um, so I, I just had some questions. I, I would like to say that sadly I am more of a futurist. Okay, fine. Um, and I did have an unhealthy obsession, let's say addiction, like you were saying, with uh, eschatology. Bless you. That was very vulnerable of you. Thank you. Uh, yes, it was pretty bad, but I just put my faith in God and whatever happens, happens. Attaboy. Um, but I do want to ask you some of your thoughts maybe. Uh, we did talk about the path of the last three eclipses, uh -huh. uh, making the Greek, I mean the Hebrew letter, the Aleph and the, the Alpha yep. and the Omega. Yep. 
and how they pass through Nineveh and all, and I just find that pretty interesting, as well as your thoughts on, um, they have the three red heifers to start the third temple. Yes, they've had them for a while. Yes, yeah, since last the, year. They have to have the original heifer's ashes in order to do anything about it, though. Oh, do they? I see. I didn't know that. I saw that they had built they the altar already. You can't consecrate the altar unless you have the last heifer that died. Ooh. Yeah. Okay, well. There's my two cents. Oh, Conspiracy I appreciate theorists go. That's the next Indiana Jones film. That's what I'm going rooting for. Indiana Jones and the Ashes of the Red Heifer. <laughs> All right, thank you. That's, that's actually... You're welcome. Thank You're you welcome. so much. Absolutely. Back there, Della. Am I good? Okay. Um, can you give an example of how dispensationalism could cause PTSD? Yeah. Um, I'll give a real example, actually. Um, kid grows up during the blood moon phase, you remember that? I remember, because I had to deal with it. Um, and is marking the blood moon cycle and everybody's speculating on when the end of the world is going to happen and the speculation arise, arrives at a year, right? Because nobody knows the day or the hour, but it's cool if we talk about the year all the time. Um, and so in their congregation, the years begin to be, to be speculated upon. In fact, the comet path and the eclipse, the sun eclipse ones, that also has a pattern that's supposed to be the end of the, or the Great Tribulation is supposed to start in 2069, something like that. Um, and so the kids in the congregation are doing the calculations. And they're going, I'm not going to graduate from high school. I'm not going to get married. I'm not going to have children. What's the point in going to college? Why should I even be thinking about my future at all if it's all going to come to a fiery burning end? That's how it starts. But they don't think they can talk about it because they feel like they're being poor Christians. Yeah. Go ahead. I had a question. Um, you were talking um, in the beginning about the uh, cage stage and the different stages that a minister kind of goes through on mm -hmm. their journey. Um, and and then, And then you were talking about, uh, you know, false doctrines arising where they get stuck and, and can't continue on. Um, and then you are also mentioning how the scripture says to always remember as a teacher that the scripture says that you will be judged more harshly. Um, so I was wondering with those who are interested in pursuing ministry, how to get past the fear of being judged on that level um, where it becomes crippling, where they deny their calling. Um, and then also how do we as a congregation support our leaders who are in that fear and who are bearing such a burden for our sakes? Wonderful, wonderful question. You call it what it is. I'm not sure fear should ever leave us as teachers. I think we, the, the moment we get so self-secure with our leveraging of the scriptures that we no longer cease to tremble when we open them, and you sit and listen to me being worried about just the intonation of my voice while I read Jesus' words. I don't want to get that wrong either. Um, I think it's really, 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 really dangerous when the teachers no longer fear. So I would actually recommend that fear should be a considerable part of hiring. <laughs> How scared are they? <laughs> um, that being said, do we want them to be so afraid that they deny a calling? That's already a little bit hairy water because I'm not entirely sure you can deny a calling. That's just my two cents. I'm not entirely sure. I haven't come down on it. This isn't the Lord speaking. It's just Anna. I don't know. Um, but what we do is we make certain that we watch our ministry leaders who are working for us 24-7. They don't get a break. It's constant. And you have, it's taking care of however many sheep. There used to be parish numbers. It used to be in, in the old times, you couldn't have more than, I see your hand back there. Um, you could not have m too many sheep per ministry leader because they couldn't keep up with it. And the designation was you could have no more than the amount of families so, such that you had dinner with them once per year. So you could never take care of more than that. It's the largest that your flock could get because they would start to degrade after that. So like mega churches weren't a thing, for example. 
Um, we need to be mindful if we're in a new framework that doesn't have all of those steps to keep the ministers safe, to have them rotated out so that one congregation doesn't constantly get the machinations of one person um, that we're making, we're checking on them, right? How's your spirit? They don't just work for you, we work for them too. And just double check, keep everybody accountable. But I, I'm not, in, and it may be because I do cult stuff so often, so keep that in mind. Um, I'm not sure fear shouldn't always be an aspect to a teacher. I get really creepy crawly when it's not. And there have been many times where that turned out to be the thing that outed that they weren't supposed to be a teacher at all. They were just teaching themselves. That's my two cents. Back there. How would a Christian diffuse a, situ a situation with a genuine believer who is stubborn to evaluate their own bias towards dispensationalism since that's what the person had been brought up in? Say the beginning of it again? What was? Essentially, how would someone who's, like, how would a Christian diffuse a situation with a, another genuine believer who is stubborn to evaluate their bias from uh, dispensationalism? How to diffuse it? That's, that's the wording I was given. Interesting. Okay, so if I'm understanding that correctly, you've got somebody who's outside of dispensationalism trying to talk to somebody who's deconstructing in, de in um, this framework. Um, just be you. I don't know if that's the right answer, but remember that you're designed specifically for right now. You're not an accident, and all of the things that you do and the fact that how you hold your face and how you speak and the tone with which you speak and the way your eyes move and your body language and all of those things, those aren't accidents. So if you're finding yourself in a situation where you've been placed with somebody in front of you to take care of, that's not an accident either. It's okay to just be yourself and to not have a script for this and to just say, I totally get it. I just listened to this apologist who railed against it for two hours. You can listen to her, I can get you a blanket some tea, whatever you need, this is very painful. If you have PTSD, I know how to deal with that too. Do you see what I mean? It doesn't, you don't have to have a pre-scripted pre anything. Um, I hope that answers the question. I'm not sure, online person, feel free to clarify. Go ahead. I've been noticing a lot lately, um, certain groups of Christians getting maybe frustrated with some of the ways that certain denominations are going, either with progressivism or just in certain ways, so they kind of branch off and it turns into the house church movement or new denominations or non-denominational. I was thinking about what you mentioned with um, Darby and how when everything got scattered, that's when things got iffy and there was less accountability. How can these people who are generally trying to find a place for their view of Christ and community, how can those leaders find that accountability and keep that in check, I guess? Okay, I'm gonna, I, I hope I'm gonna answer this correctly. You can tell me if I'm not. Um, there's something to do with the fact that we get caught up in empire building as Christians, right? We forget that nobody promises our amazing new way of handling something, like something works really well. Right, and it's like, oh wow, this looks like it's, uh, it's inspired by the spirit, this is great. What happens in America and Great Britain regularly is they have this thing, it works really well, and then they go, we should make a denomination out of this. It's a movement now. Like, did the Holy Spirit tell you that, or did you tell you that? Because we're Christians, we're not empire builders. It's entirely possible that the Holy Spirit is blessing that for the people, because that's what these people need. And so I, I automat I start slowing way down, pump the brakes, pump the brakes, pump the brakes, every time something like really great and new happens. And the first iteration of it is to go, let's make a movement then. Make absolutely certain that that's what the Holy Spirit told you to do. Because sometimes it's just, you no, know, you're doing what I asked you to do with the people I asked you to do it with. And I handle that stuff, right? That, that's kind of where I go in my head. Just because it happens so often. Hey, friend. Hey, Anna. Um, her last question reminded me of Peter saying, let's build three temples. Um, but that's, that's 
just extra. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, uh, uh, this has really uh, hit me pretty hard uh, from the way I was raised and the, the area and the church that I was raised in um, was very much like uh, what you described. Um, and since, uh, I think you know that, you know, I have come out of that. Um, and so that um, I started uh, what I call reading the Bible for what it was instead of um, more of, uh, I think what happens to a lot of people is they um, go and they listen on Sunday morning or Sunday evening if they go twice or, or three times even, and they listen to what's being preached, but they never read their own Bible themselves. Um, and I was a victim of that. And so I was taught the Bible in the way that it was preached. And so when I started reading the Bible and letting the Holy Spirit um, reveal to me what it was, um, a lot of my views changed. And these are a lot of the views that changed. Well done. Yes, yeah. the resurgence of the papacy. Yes. And um, so if I had one thing to say tonight, it is read your own Bible. And, and always pray and get in the spirit before you read because the author of what you're reading will be with you and explain to you just like if you had an author of a book, a regular book that was wrote and you didn't really understand exactly what's happening, the author could explain it to you. So. That'll preach, brother. That'll preach. Anybody else? Oh, here we go. Okay. My question is about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So you said that it's not a particular event. It's a lifelong and potentially longer than that process of denial of repentance. Yeah, it's a state so, of one's spirit. Obviously, there are people who disagree with you because dispensationalism exists and yes. has a hold on people. Mm -hmm. Even if they disagree, or even if they agree in their heart, they might not in their mind. Mm -hmm. So my question is, is there anything that takes you to that conclusion outside of thinking that it's inconsistent with the rest of the scripture? Like anything particular to the language used? Because it would, oh, be wrong like to, it would be wrong to impose our definition of blasphemy onto the way it was used back then. So is there any yes. cultural context or specific language context that leads you to the conclusion that that's what was meant by the word blasphemy? Oh, hmm. Y the answer is yes. The Greek does do that. It really does. Um, whether or not I could prove that right this second, I don't think I could. You'd have to be taking my word for it. But you don't have to take my word for it because the Greek's available to everybody at any time. And if there is a dispensational person that would like to debate me on that subject, that can be arranged. Okay. Yes, Della. So there was an update clarification oh, okay. on the previous thing. Uh, the question is really, um, it's more along the lines of how to share the flaws or concerns within of dispensationalism. Uh, oh, okay. Like the person is like believes dispensationalism to be the truth. Mm -hmm. That type of like, how do I, how does this person like help them see the flaws? Memes. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I normally do it. Um, I don't. I don't know. Be kind. Be polite call it what it is, you know, you can, when you're dealing with cognitive dissonance stuff, what you want to do is you want them to not receive you as an immediate enemy. Um, that's really, really, really important for their brain. It's not about something that has to do with like manipulation or anything. You tell them the positive things about dispensationalism so that they know you're not there to just attack it. And then from there, pray and listen, because I'm not going to have the exact details on how to handle that, and I'm not saying that to try to avoid the answer to the question. I've seen beautiful, wonderful, incredible things work, and I'm listening to the person do it, and I was like, wow, I would have never gone there. But it worked really well. And that tends, again, to be a, a Holy Spirit moment. So just tell the truth and be yourself. Hi. So when listening to a Christian speaker, like pastor or whatever speak, mm -hmm. what um, like diction or phrasing should we look for to kind of know that they're like dispensationalist or Darbyist or something like that? Oh, I don't think you can. Um, cause I, when I said the spectrum, so I don't know if you've listened to like John MacArthur sermons versus John Hagee. I mean, they could be, they couldn't be more 
separate. I mean, very, very different. Um, the content will tell you, though. The content will. I'm not sure about the diction. Although, we have a joke in the field that if the podium that they're standing behind is clear, they're dispensational. <laughs> That's your, there's your, your insight. Anybody else? Go ahead, Forrest. That's fine. So several times you use the word progressivism as if that, that is a condemnation. And Theological I progressivism, not political. Uh, that's perhaps a good distinction, because it probably does get to the question I will still ask. Okay. Um, and I, I begin with the fact that at a, school, a Board of Education meeting about six months ago, I asked the question uh, after uh, a minister said, oh, we need uh, prayer in the school and Bible study in the school. Mm -hmm. And the following month, I said, well, that's going to turn into a question of which Bible and who's going to lead prayer. Mm -hmm. And I said, after all, there, right here in Blount County, we had the Society of Friends that, against the law, ran an underground railroad at great personal risk. Mm -hmm. And right here in Blount County, we have churches of the Southern Baptist Convention that split from their northern brethren when their northern brethren said, you cannot be missionaries and own people. That's true. And so uh, I have to say, these are pretty extremely different. Mm -hmm. and, and I would have called the Quakers progressive. Now, you, okay. you, you raised a, a distinction possibly how we mean it politically versus theologically. Yeah, you're missing a bit, but that's okay. I keep going. Well, and I will say that actually I think the Quakers were, I would say, non-biblical. Oh. And I would say, in, in justification, that I'd say, could you read Leviticus 25, 44 through 46? What was the chapter again? 25, 44 through 46. As for your male and female slaves who may belong to you, you may buy male and female slaves from the nations all around you. Also, you may buy slaves from the children of the foreigners who reside with you and from their families th that are with you, whom they have fathered in your land. They may become your property. Am I supposed to read 46 as well or 246? Uh, uh, 46 as well. because You it says may inherit give them, them as an inheritance to your children after you to possess as property. You may enslave them perpetually. However, as for your brothers, the Israelites, no man may rule over his brother harshly. Yeah. So, and I would call that unambiguously evil, mm -hmm. but it is biblical. Um, and yet I would say the Quakers did not follow that. They and didn't. that they were progressive, non-biblical. And mm -hmm. thus my question, how is it that we can treat these people, the, 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 to, to say that they're both Christians, a Christian sex, mm -hmm. glosses over really important differences. It does, it does. Um, so the Quakers, from an orthodoxy perspective, which is what we're discussing. I'm just doing this for clarity for the, the audience, because functionally we're talking about two things, which is how to categorize Leviticus. We're talking about which sects are orthodox, and we're also talking about the definitions of progressive and orthodox and all the things are coming up, yeah? So a complex question. So give me just a second, if it's okay, I'm gonna take just a second to, to extrapolate. Number one, the definition for what is considered a denomination of Christianity falls to only three things, and that is the comp what comprises the gospel. Everything else can be debated, truly. That's why we have denominations and not separate religions. So sect is totally fine. Cult means that they've departed from one of those three things. That's how we make that distinction. So the Quakers, in spite of the fact that they disagreed with um, antebellum SBC holdouts is not really relevant to whether or not they're Christians, not in a progressive versus conservative sense. Number two, there are many, many examples of old, because the Southern Baptist Convention um, had many, many, many representatives that were also abolitionists. It was a giant debate, though. You're right that it's there. And the split between the North and the South was for that reason, so that's excellent um, and accurate. The, the fact of the matter is that the, it doesn't that those belief systems are not something that defines whether or not the group, the denomination, is considered Christian, just from a definitional perspective. So I'm going to leave that there. 
The second part of the question was whether or not the Quakers are being biblical, right? So we do in Christianity what's called hermeneutics, which means there are categories of analysis and that this book has breaks, like, for example, the fact that Levitical law was undone in the New Testament, which means we wouldn't ever go to Leviticus on that particular law and apply it as though it is something that happens post-Christ or even a discussion that we need to have post-Christ, which is part of why Paul talks about slavery the way that he does in the New Testament. So we would never go there as an analysis point in Christianity. The third question of whether or not it's moral to hold slaves is a huge topic that has been dealt with ad nauseum by Paul Copan, as well as something that I've addressed in several talks already that I will give you the links for. But in general, in case you can't see those, in general, what is happening is that you'll notice that last caveat, the harshly thing. Even in Leviticus, when that type of slavery is instituted in a culture that required slavery in order to live, which is what's happening there, even there, they are commanded that they are not allowed to be harsh and they get in trouble later for ignoring that law. So in spite of the fact that the Bible documents something horrible, which it is, that does not mean that Yahweh said it was okay. Totally different thing. The Bible talks all the time about awful things that human beings do, and they're very amoral. Totally different thing to say that Yahweh authored that, though. And that's where Christians would make those distinctions. Of course, there are tons of things to document here. It's a history book, and humans are awful. Okay? Ask me if you've answered my question. I can't tell. Maybe I didn't. You did not. Well, okay, so your final question was what? I beg your pardon. Maybe I got lost. Well, uh, you, you took a good stab. Uh, okay. I'll give you points on that. All right. Uh, the very last sentence or so of Leviticus uh, 46, I believe, says over your Hebrew brethren, you will not rule unjustly. Uh, yeah, it says that you can't rule over them. And then it says you can't do it harshly. No man may yeah. rule over yeah. his it, brother harshly. It, it was, well, it was... It was the Hebrew brothers that you couldn't rule over harshly, and you could not make them perpetual property. If so, this were the only segment of scripture that we have giving those parameters, you would have an excellent point, but it's not. And I'm having to take into account a ton of other ones. Two minutes? He's saying two minutes. Go I ahead. understand, um, uh, but it can't be resolved in two minutes. And I, I would say yeah, that, I that that, that Can I invite people yeah. to our breakfast? Did you know that Forrest and I, Forrest is the head of the Knoxville Rationalist Society. He and I have a long-standing breakfast. If you would like to come eat pancakes and watch Anna and Forrest go back and forth on slavery, that can be arranged. Works for me. <laughs> Thanks, Forrest. Last question. Um, I had more of a question relating to how dispensationalism has sort of permeated into other churches. Um, we talked at length about um, eschatology and how it's present there and the influence of uh, how churches conduct themselves and what they preach on. Uh, but I'm interested in to where else it may appear. Like an example it was in the Hebrews talk, you spoke on how Hebrews directly addresses the idea that uh, dispensationalism uh, wouldn't work because there isn't two, uh, two salvific uh, structures for two different uh, groups of people. Mm -hmm. um, are there any ways that uh, dispensationalism is present and stuff like uh, Baptists are not denominational churches because it's prevalent there where it will cause them to uh, I guess speak heresies or take uh, the general acceptance of that scripture without looking into it uh, well, not scripture, of the idea without looking into it would cause them to speak heresies or lead people astray Yeah, suggesting that there are people that don't need Christ is pretty bad so if you're in a circle where that, a church where that is what is being taught, I would press back against that really, really, really hard. Um, is this answering your question? I can't tell. Um, the other thing that you could do is focus on the fact of having everybody predicated in their hope on the rapture as opposed to in the atonement and the focus shift. That can be really problematic really quickly as well because then you have people in your congregations who are there out of fear and not because they know Christ. That means you're preaching to people who are not Christ oriented. They're not, they could be, they could not be sheep at all. That's a problem. 
Does that help you? Okay. Are you my last question? Nope. Okay, you're closing it down. So our Not child care workers work till now. Perfect. And so if you have children, we're asking you to go grab your kids if you don't mind. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. I love you all. I'll see you next time. If in doubt, please ask all the time. Ask questions.